Hello and welcome to another episode of Do Go On, episode 22, I believe. Can you believe we've made it this far? My name is Dave Warnicky, and I'm sitting here with Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. Guys, happy 22nd birthday. Oh, thank, oh, thank you. you. Thanks, Dave. Thanks, Dave. Uh, uh, and and, and to, you to you too. Too, as well. <laughs> as well. Thank you so also. much. Also. <laughs> You'll be speaking in uh, unison again. I thought we'd broken out of that habit, but that is okay. Matt. We're doing on. some improv again, I think. <laughs> Is that this is what we thought improv was? Yeah. Speaking at the same <laughs> speaking time. Speaking at the same time. Yeah, just speaking over each other's sentences. That's right. Uh, are you well, Matthew? Uh, I am I'm very, very well. well. Thank you. Thank you. Got a little bit of a voice thing going on. Jess is trying to do an impression <laughs> of you as well with a low, low voice. All right, I'm going to ask Jess how she is. Jess, how are you? I'm um, pretty, pretty good. good. <laughs> and you used to use your Queen Elizabeth II voice. I'm pretty good. Isn't that how you talk? Yeah, it is how I talk. That's That's very nice. I get confused when I hear the Queen on the radio. I'm like, oh, Jess. Yeah. She's doing uh, breakfast radio for Joy now. <laughs> but, yeah, it's very confusing. <laughs> Jess, of course, uh, the, for context there, is hosting uh, breakfast radio on uh, the Joy Network. Was I that, am. Will I say that properly? On yeah. w- Wednesdays? On Wednesdays. Yeah, very good. Thanks for that little plug. I do yes. that on Wednesday mornings. Really good radio if you're in, in uh, Melbourne, Australia. Correct. Or there's probably a podcast of it too somewhere. Yeah, in Melbourne, Florida. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not like anyone listening to this enjoys podcasts. No, no, right? no. Anyway, guys, this is a podcast where we uh, take it in turns to research a topic, prepare a report on that topic, and present it to the other two guys in the room. It is my turn this week. And we always start with a question. Now, um, I'm, I am going to say that this one is from a listener's suggestion. Oh, right. cool. We had a, from the hat. From the hat. It's from the hat, but also I specifically chose the topic. Oh. <laughs> didn't pull it at random. Okay, cool. We just had an email from uh, Brett. He said he enjoyed the uh, one of the last ones I did, The Curse of the Pharaohs, and he wanted a, another mystery sort of Ooh, one. Ooh, okay, cool. So I um, went through a lot of, uh, you know, did a lot of Googling, finding mysteries that I'd never heard of. And I found one that I'm not, f- I wasn't familiar with, and I- maybe you aren't either. But I'm going to start with, we've well, got two questions. First of all, for a bit more ambiguity, have you ever been skydiving, Jess? No, I have not. Matt, skydiving? You feel, I feel like that you, out of the three have. of us, are the most likely to I say haven't. yes. You haven't. No, I'd but be you up would for do it, but, yeah. yeah. But I think it's expensive, and it's the kind of thing like, when do you go, well, you know what I'm going to do? Like, who makes plans to go skydiving? I think it's usually more of a holiday type thing. Like, you're in Queensland. Yeah, like I went bungee jumping when I was in New Zealand. Yeah, that's it. And it's because you're going past somewhere that's famous for it. And that's that's why I would. Or if someone's like, do you want to come skydiving with me? I'd say yes. Like a a voucher for Christmas or something. I was going to say, a few of my friends got vouchers for their 21st. So, they all sort of went together and I... I drove them, <laughs> and I watched, and then I waited and went, okay, did you have fun? Cool, let's did go you, Were, you, were in- you left out by them or by yourself? By That's myself. My, oh, by my myself. Question. I was wondering, were you not invited <laughs> or... No, she was invited to drive them. Yeah, no, I just, I was like, no, I'm good, thanks. So you would never do it? Nah. No, thank you. All right, well, uh, okay, so when none of us are skydivers. That's the first question. Second question is, um, it's pretty much, have you ever heard of this story? Have you ever heard... <laughs> Well, I just want to know if you have. Have you ever heard of a man called D.B. Cooper? D.B. Cooper? No. no. D.B. Cooper. I don't know any skydiving mysteries. Yeah, well, as soon as you said skydiving, I was like, I do not know this story. Oh, that's great. That is great news because I found this story and I, I'd never heard of it. I uh, started reading about it and I was gripped <gasps> about the mystery of D.B. Cooper. So let's just get into it, shall we? Okay. Is the first mystery what D.B. stands for? That will never be explained. Drum and bass. It'll never be explained. But you I don't will, know? But I'll come back to D.B. Cooper at the end of this episode. Oh, okay. So the, it's not even the, about D.B. Cooper. No, I'll come back to that name. Oh, okay. With a little not-so-fun fun fact at the end. Okay. Oh, man. This is already exciting. Dead okay. Beat. So I've got to take you back. Back in time to... Deadbeat. Deadbeat Cooper. Deadbeat Cooper. I think that's it. Decibel Cooper. <laughs> oh, database Cooper. Dingbat Cooper. <laughs> Dog boy. Dog boy Cooper. Oh, that's my favourite. <laughs> I, th- yeah, I thought we weren't going to beat Dingbat, but... <laughs> <laughs> she did it with Dog, dog boy. Dog boy's pretty good. <laughs> All right, let, let's continue to call him Dog boy Cooper. <laughs> but I've got to take you back in time to a simpler time known as 1971. Ah, uh, quaint. A what simple a time. time. Yeah. We've got to d- go to the United States of America. On November 24th, 1971, the eve of Thanksgiving... Mm. 
This is before a long weekend. A man wearing a black suit, carrying a black attaché case, approaches the flight counter of Northwest Orient Airlines, the Portland International Airport in Oregon, on the west coast of the United States. He walks up to the counter and identifies himself as Dan Cooper. Ooh, Dan Cooper. Disappointing. Not day. dog. <laughs> he puts a... Tw- <laughs> He puts a single $20 could be, could bill. Could be an alias. <laughs> You've actually guessed it. You actually have. Um, so he says his name is Dan Cooper. He puts a single $20 bill on the counter and purchases a one-way ticket on flight 305, which is a 30-minute trip to Seattle, Washington. $20 flight? 20 bucks back Okay, then. Well, that's the first mystery. Well, it's only a... Thir- the mystery of the low, low prices. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's only a 30-minute flight. Still... Jetstar to bloody Tassie, Tassie Hobart's yeah. 20 minute flight No 30 minute flight About 30 how, minutes How much are you paying Matt? Uh, uh, I reckon you could you Oh could, I got $50 flights actually You could get See, cheap but That was Tiger though 50 bucks So we and had to fly is, the plane ourselves But you're not rocking up And putting 20 bucks on the counter for that You've got to find an internet <laughs> deal That's a missed my joke slamming. Oh not again <laughs> This happens so much It's fine whatever Don't worry One of our friends will pick us <laughs> yeah. up Yeah Please go on. Is which, it worth repeating? Nah. Which, well... I'll listen back, all right, yeah. Jeff? <laughs> Rewind for that little nugget. And uh, we do enjoy when people uh, post the jokes <laughs> on our Facebook. No, we just generally do when people I repeat love stuff that Matt and I have probably missed by speaking over one Jess Perkins. <laughs> uh, but Dan Kirby didn't have to show ID at all at this time. Okay. He was just given the ticket. They just take your name. You just write it down. That's Pre-9-11. How so- it was a different yeah, time. That's how sophisticated their system was. Uh, Cooper... Obviously, he waited around a bit, but we cut to when he's boarding the aircraft, which is a Boeing 727. It's quite important. A Boeing 727. 727. He took a seat in the rear of the passenger cabin. He lit a cigarette, as you were allowed to do back then. What a gangster. Simpler time. And he ordered a bourbon and soda. Yeah. Bourbon and soda. Alrighty. Eyewitnesses on board, just to paint the picture of this guy, recalled Cooper to be a man in his mid 40s. He's between 5 foot 10 and 178 centimeters. And uh, six foot exactly, 183 centimetres tall. He wore a black, lightweight raincoat. He's wearing loafers, dark suit, neatly pressed white collared tie, a black necktie, and a mother of pearl tie pin. You know what a tie pin is? Those things that you... Pin on your tie? Clip onto the tie, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, I'm not a fucking idiot, Dave. (laughs) A tie pin. Do you know what that is? (laughs) Hey, Dave, you see that wall over there? You know what a wall is? Well, the tie pin <laughs> might come back to the story. Oh, okay. I'm okay. writing that down too. Right. I'm going to draw it. Okay. Because I yeah. know what it looks like. Draw to me what you think a tie pin looks like. I actually don't know. A well, mother like, of pearl tie pin? Yeah. Do you know what a tie pin looks well, like? Well, like, Jess? where does the tie pin I wore go? one at a, a wedding On the recently. tie. On the tie itself. To so keep so it onto the yeah. shirt. No? Just no, keep it just. Oh, keep the tie together. Yeah, to keep the front of the tie together. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Matt, are you actually I, aware of what a tie clip is? Yeah, I wore, I wore one at a recent wedding. Fact, I've still I still got it. Do you want it? Is it a mother of pearl one? No, it's a, it's an uncle. Okay, well, uncle of pearl. Matt probably. <laughs> Why didn't you miss that joke, Jeff? <laughs> you I never miss the wrong one. I don't miss anything. She never misses. <laughs> uh, so DB. <laughs> Or Dan Cooper, as he's known at this stage, is uh, he's on the flight, uh, which took off at two fifty on so time. So he's so he's used an alias, right, with the same initial and exact same surname. No, 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 shittest no. alias I've ever heard. No, 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 no. I'll explain the in, the two names. Okay, it's a bit confusing. That's exciting. So at this stage, we're calling him Dan Cooper because that's what he's called himself. Uh, so he's on the plane. It took off on time, two fifty p.m. In the afternoon. It's supposed to take thirty minutes. It's only a third full. Okay. There's not that many people sitting Does there. Does that mean they'll get there faster because the plane is lighter? Science says yes. <laughs> <laughs> so far, you've just told a quite a boring story about a man catching a plane. No. Okay. All right. Next paragraph. Whilst taking off, Cooper passed a note to a flight attendant nearest to him. Her name is Florence Schaffner. Should I write that down? Is she important? She's, she's going to be in the story. Florence Schaffner. Shaff- Florence Schaffner. Can we call her Flo Schaff? <laughs> <laughs> I insist. <laughs> Flo Chef. <laughs> he passes a note to Flo Chef, who was sitting in a uh, what's known as a jump seat, which is like a a crew seat attached to the door. You know when they ha- get to sit down for a little bit while it takes off. He but he's sitting close to her, so he passes her a note. Flo Chef assumes the note contains this uh, lonely businessman's phone number and that he was just hitting on her. So Good she assumption. she just dropped it into his purse, into her purse. Oh, Flo Chef, so she's up like, yourself. whatever. It's I get phone numbers every flight. Well, I think it's the 1970s. They're smoking on a plane. It's pretty, you know, 
It's a sleazy time. It's a sleazy time. That's what I'm trying to paint the picture here. Mm-hmm. Anyway, Cooper then leans towards her and whispers, Miss, you'd better look at that note. I have a bomb. <gasps> Bombshell. Boom. Are the notes... Feels like a bit of an attention seek, like a like a primary school thing. Like, I I just got a bomb. I've got a check. I also got a bl- if you really had a bomb, just, do you need people to know you have a bomb? Just blow it up. Yeah. Just, blow, just blow up the bomb. That's when people all know that you've got a bomb. Yeah. Not just, because just you've written a little note, you fuckhead. Jess, I'm not going to lie here. You're clearly not very good at hijacking a plane and getting what you want. You're absolutely right. You get the bomb on board and you just blow it up before. Oh shit! I should have asked for money. But those plans never work. What happens? They give him the stuff he wants and then they land the plane where there's only one exit, or, you know, yeah. two exits, which they can have surrounded by whoever. I guess he's still got the bomb. Plus, the plane's only a third full. They'd probably be like, nah, just let him go. Just let him go. Just let him go. Let him blow it up. Well, they, they paid $20 fares. Yeah, These people. we're fine. They're dead to us already. <laughs> uh, the note, it was printed in neat all capital letters written with a felt pen. It read approximately, because he asked to get the note back later... I have a bomb in my briefcase. I will use it if necessary. I want you to sit next to me because you are being hijacked. Bum, 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 That's course. like such a sexy threat. Yeah. <laughs> also, looking back at this... And then she said, is that a bomb, a bomb in your, in your briefcase? briefcase? Or are you just and he said, yes, I just said. <laughs> Read the fucking oh my notes, God. Roche. Flow shaft Flo-sha. is a slow shaft. <laughs> also, if you pass a note to someone and you are hitting on them and they don't read it, if you say, you better read it, I've got a bomb, they're probably going to read it. And yeah. then they read it and it says, lol jokes, my phone number is yeah. 04. Jeez, do how you, low in you... confidence were you that you had to do the lol jokes before even giving it to them? Do you like yeah, me? Tick right. yes, yes or no. Imagine if you just handed it to them and it just said, lol jokes, my phone number is. Uh, no, it's actually got a questionnaire. It says, uh, it's in two pages. If I've just told you I have a bomb, turn to the next page. Yeah. Yeah. If not, read on. Hello, my name is Dan Cooper. Yeah. Like a create your own ending story. Yes, yeah, so a uh, choose, your own, choose your own adventure, picking up. <laughs> Great. Great. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. Without the bomb, probably. I'm going to say that. Probably. Oh, okay. Interesting. So he's asked, uh, <laughs> but he's asked Flo Shaft to sit next to him, and of course she has obliged. Uh, but imagine if it had been a full flight and he'd had someone sitting next to him, it would have been difficult for her to sit there. So luckily it's pretty empty. Uh, Flo Shaft asks to see the bomb. So Cooper cracks open his, his briefcase long enough for her to glimpse eight red cylinders attached to wires coated with red insulation and a large cylindrical battery. So it was assumed at the time that the red cylinders were sticks of dynamite. He sat, and uh, for the rest of the flight, he sat with his hand inside the suitcase with a w- wire ready to touch it to the battery, which in theory would set off the bomb. Oh man, all this in theories and they thought this at the time means it's Play-Doh or yeah. some sort of... Dave, you've given it away. This is a fake bomb. It is not a fake bomb. <gasps> oh, seriously? It is not a fake bomb. Holy shit. Okay, then Cooper... Dan Kubert, he dictated his demands to Flow Shaft. He wanted $200,000 in, quote, American currency. Oh, interesting. Quite well, specific. okay, so he's paid $20 for a flight. He's going to turn that into $200,000. That's which a lot of money. In modern day money, is over a million US dollars. I mean, he has overheads, so he's got to recoup those before he makes a profit. Recouper those. Ah, DB Recouper. Do you think the B's for bomb? <laughs> That's bomber. what I was thinking before. Dirty bomber. Dirty bomber. No. Dirty bomber Cooper. D- Dodgy bomber. Da bomb. Da bomb. Da bomb. <laughs> I am da bomb. <laughs> That's Cooper. Uh, he also wanted four parachutes. That's too many. Two primary and You're two, one man. And two reserves. So two main. He's taken flow shaft with him. He's got one on each limb. You also want. <laughs> It takes him heaps longer to land, though. <laughs> That's a really funny visual if you've got four parachutes strapped to each. I'll never die this way. And then they just get horribly tangled. Your arms tangled. get ripped off. <laughs> they get horribly tangled and you fall to your death. Yeah. Um, he wanted a fuel truck standing by in Seattle to refuel the aircraft when they land. Uh, Flo Schaff conveyed Kuba's instructions uh, by going to the cockpit and she told the pilot, hey, we're being hijacked. And they all... Started. Hey, just let you and know. And again, again, do you reckon this is a different time when... Because like, the cockpits are locked now. Like, nobody can get in there, right? So do you reckon it was just a time when there's just a curtain? She was like, um, guys... Hey. Sorry, this- just quickly, um, I will get you a cup of tea. Just firstly, first, uh, quick we'll note. The back of the plane, there's a guy called Da Bomb Cooper. <laughs> yeah. He's got a bomb. He just wants a few things. Anyway, uh, sandwiches, cool for you guys. I'll be back in a minute then. Because she's a professional. Yeah. 
That's right. Well, she is a goddamn professional. Fly, have you seen the bomb? Because I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna start driving this plane differently unless someone's seen the bomb. Have you seen the bomb? Am I playing flow again? No, I'm, I'm looking at you, hoping that. You... Anyway, let's move on. <laughs> she had nothing. Flow right there. I thought you said she was a professional. She's not. Too bad that the actor portraying her was not. No, go on. Anyway, I will go on, because this, this is one of my favourite parts of the story. <laughs> okay. When uh, Flo Chef returns, Cooper was wearing dark sunglasses. <laughs> <laughs> hey, it is... <laughs> just put sunnies on. I just go tell the pilot I've got a bum. She comes back. Hey, baby. <laughs> He's the coolest guy ever. <laughs> I don't... I'm, even though you've told me it's a real bomb and this seems like a, a really dumb thing to do, I like this guy. <laughs> he seems cool. DB... Terrorists D- are cool. <laughs> there, I said there. it. <laughs> So anyway, the f- <laughs> should I keep that in? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> uh, just let, let, just well, let every let... now and then Jess tells it like it is and you want to silence her? Not good, Dave. <laughs> well, I just want to say if ASIO, the federal police are listening, then I do not agree with oh. what Jess just said. Remember, um, this is a comedy podcast. I think ASIO know better than anyone that terrorists are rad. <laughs> like, they, they, they know all about it. <laughs> do you feel like that half our downloads are from federal police officers scanning the topics? <laughs> The opening of Disneyland, that sounds suspicious. Yeah. <laughs> Left-handedness, sort of I'm on to you. Uh, yeah. Who would talk about that for an hour and 15 minutes? <laughs> Perkins. This is clearly some sort of coded message. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, the, the pilot, William Scott, he contacted uh, the Seattle-Tacoma Airport Traffic Control and told them what was going on about the bomb and his dema- uh, Cooper's demands, and they inform, informed local and federal authorities. The 36 other passengers... 36 on... passengers? That's not many people. No. Paying 20 bucks each is not very much. Uh, they were informed that their arrival in Seattle would, would be delayed because of minor technical difficulties. Sure. So they don't know they're being hijacked. Everything's still cool for them. Even though there's a guy in sunglasses on the plane. <laughs> I reckon I would have figured it out. <laughs> we're clearly being hijacked. But it was like 3 o'clock in the afternoon, you know, so it, was, it, could, have been sun- it could have been bright. Have you ever seen someone wear sunglasses on a... F- on an aeroplane. Well, I've seen people wearing them around a shopping centre. I'm sure people have worn them on an aeroplane. Every time you see that, just think, terrorist. Yeah, yeah definitely. Everyone out! <laughs> uh, the president of the Northwest Orient Airline, which is Donald Nyrup, which, if you're a fan of sport, his son was ice hockey legend Bill Nyrup. Oh, yes. Mm. Is he Wayne Gretzky? He's is like he a, in Mighty Ducks? Like an early Wayne Gretzky. He won yeah. several ice hockey championships in the 1970s. Not in Mighty Ducks. Anyway. Is he played by Emilio Estefan? Estefan? Estevez. Estevez. As long as you have no follow-up questions, then yes. Okay, great. <laughs> uh, so, but anyway, the president of the airline, he authorised payment of the ransom. And he ordered all employees to cooperate fully with the hijackers. He just said, give him what he wants. I don't want anyone to get hurt. So the aircraft then just circled the airport for approximately two hours. What? To allow the it's a half hour flight. I know to allow the police and the FBI to assemble the parachutes and ransom money. Okay, well by this time, if I was on that plane, I'd be like, "Well, I can mm. see Seattle Airport. Seattle yeah. is where they're landing, right?" Yeah, they you can see yet. the airport. No, I would. To be honest, I wouldn't think terrorist attack. I would think they've said mechanical difficulties and you can't land for two hours. I would think. Yeah, get the thing down. I would think something's gone wrong. Like, you can't land yeah. the plane, what's going on? The, the wheels yeah. aren't coming down. The wheels down. aren't coming down. And this guy's briefcase is ticking. <laughs> is that is that at all re- involved in this? Is that related? <laughs> and, and that air hostess isn't serving sandwiches. She's just sitting next to that guy with sunglasses for two hours. That's weird. I mean, yeah. he's pretty cool, but you could maybe <laughs> chat to him later. Yeah, come on. He's, well, he handed her the number. Just, yeah. Right. yeah, you've got, a, you've got his contacts. Uh, they also needed time to mobilise emergency personnel, like cops and ambulances, fire engines, that kind of stuff. Two hours it takes. Dave, Dave just explained to us what emergency personnel were. Fucking thanks, hell. Dave. First the tie pin. I better write down what an emergency person is. Okay, thanks. I am using my voice to paint a delightful picture <laughs> of this undelightful situation. <laughs> yeah, do go on. Thank you. Uh, Stuart Flo Chef. She recalls that Cooper appeared familiar with the local terrain. At one point, he remarked, Oh, looks like Tacoma down there. <laughs> the, the 
fuck? To make a weird small talk. As the aircraft flew above it, <gasps> he also mentioned correctly that the McCord Air Force Base was only a 20 minute drive from the Seattle Tacoma Airport. He's making the strangest small talk ever. He is, but it also, he obviously clearly knows the area well. I reckon he's trying to get him off the scent. I reckon he's from Canada. Yeah. Could be Canadian. I reckon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think you're on something there, Matt. Well, this is more. He was described as uh, calm, polite. Too calm, maybe. And well-spoken. Nah, another, another, never trust those people. Never trust them. Well, what you, wait, were you trusting this hijacker before? That? Well-spoken <laughs> and calm. No, thank you. Polite. Yeah. Get out. I think that this guy, man with a bomb has some sinister plans. <laughs> wait, Dave. Sp- spoiler alert. <laughs> Another attendant told investigators that he wasn't nervous, he seemed rather nice, he was never cruel or nasty, he was thoughtful and calm all the time. Oh, I have the biggest crush on Dan Cooper right now. In fact, he ordered a second bourbon and paid his drink tab. Fuck, he's cool! He's so cool! And insisted that Flo Chef keep the change. Fuck off! He's tipping! What a legend! Well, he's about to make 200 grand, fair, but I love this guy. I hope it all works out really well for him. He's he's either making 200 grand, he's gonna be blown up by himself, or he's going to jail. All good options. Yeah, He's got nothing to lose. He's got no reason for the change in his pocket. Except his life and And 200 grand. Yeah. (laughs) He's got everything to lose. Uh, He also uh, offered to request meals for the flight crew during the stop in Seattle. He is the hijacker dreamboat we've been waiting for. Oh my god, he's a babe. I'm imagining him, well, because he's quite tall too. I'm imagining just like super hot. And he's wearing sunnies. Yeah, that's cool. They don't make hijackers like that anymore. <laughs> they just don't. When was the last time you heard of a hijacker wear, wearing a clip-on on his tie? You know what? Let alone one made of Mother of Pearl. Yeah. It's, you know, I just realised what DB stands for. Dreamboat. Oh, oh. Dreamboat, dreamboat Cooper. Coop, Coop's the dreamboat. Mm. I really hope everything's turned out well for him. I reckon it has. Yeah. I reckon he's okay. I reckon he's now... You're making some predictions early on here, guys? Yeah, easy, early predictions. I reckon he went on to become uh, Obama or something like that. Yeah, no, yeah. Like, like president. Because, like yeah, I reckon it's... um. Or Donald Trump. Yeah. Soon to be president. Yeah. I've just dated this episode. <laughs> yeah, hope, hopefully badly. Do you reckon, is, did he become president? Or are you gonna? You'll save that for the end. I will. Uh, that's one of the fun facts. I'll tell you what countries he became president of, and what countries he never became president of. Ooh, there's a long list of both. <laughs> <laughs> um, me, me. <laughs> so while Dreamboat De Bomb Cooper is just charming the whole plane while still having a bomb. Oh, so good. On the ground, the FBI agents are hurriedly assembling the ransom money from these uh, several Seattle area banks, and they're making the two hundred thousand dollars in twenty dollar bills because he didn't say what what denominations he wanted. So they are they kind of being dicks about it then? A little bit. I like that. It makes it heavier or harder to. When you said they yeah. were like hurriedly collecting, I like to think they were going around to everybody in the office, like oh, whatever you got, just come on, <laughs> chip it in. No, no, seriously, it's important. Thirty six people could die, plus flow chef. Uh, they made a microfilm photograph of each, which, doing the maths, is 10,000 photographs. Oh, that's cl- so they could track it. Yeah, so they made a record, and it's, they're non-marked, but they are, they've taken a note of every single serial number. So when D.B. Cooper Bloody spends hell. these, you can track hell it no. later on. Uh, they also had to get his parachutes ready. Cooper rejected military-issue parachutes initially offered by authorities, demanding instead civilian parachutes with manually operated rip cords. So military ones, you jump out of the plane, it just goes automatically. Oh. He wanted ones where he was in control of it. Uh, so they had to hmm. obtain them from a local skydiving school in Seattle. That's where they had them. But he was very clever. You said that you should have just asked for one. He's very actually clever to ask for four because they had to assume that he might put one on the flight attendant or the pilot or yeah. someone and take them with him. So that way they couldn't give him just a fake parachute so if he jumped out, he would just die. Oh. Yeah, smart. So he was thinking that he might take up to three people with him. So they had to give him... Far out. So they all had to work just in case that he was going to take some innocence with he's him. He's a genius. I reckon he's got some sort of military police background. You think so? Yeah. yeah. I was trying to read your face then and you did not react at all. I think that we could... Um, I studied you just then. <laughs> describe him as a dance break Cooper. Oh. Do a little boogie for the 200 grand. Boom. Uh, at five... At five Boom. Boom. To- at 5.24pm, Cooper was informed that his demands had been met 
and at 5.39, the aircraft landed safely at Seattle Tacoma Airport. So their 30-minute flight took nearly three hours. Great. Well, for 20 bucks, that's what you get, That's you what know? you get. Yeah. Some people... Maybe a stopover. I think it would be pretty hilarious if... Um, so the, because the people on board still don't know, they're probably starting to complain, hey, I'm going to miss my... My, you know, my connecting flight, all this oh, stuff. My, uh, the Seattle Supersonics versus exactly. Houston Rockets oh, match. Oh, on my son's birthday. I'm going to mm. miss the big game and you can't whisper, just calm down. Someone's got a bomb. Yeah. There's bigger issues here. You guys, you fell into my trap. The Supersonics weren't a team yet. <laughs> oh, no. He's got us. I don't think. I have no idea. It's the dumbest thing you've ever said. You just fa- you walked right into it, Perko. You fine. <laughs> You bloody idiot. <laughs> uh, the plane taxied to an isolated area of the airport, and uh, Cooper wanted the lights dim so snipers couldn't try and take him out. He's clever. Well, that's then, I, clever. I don't think that stops him from trying. It might <laughs> stop him from succeeding, Dave. Got him. <laughs> You're on fire today. I'm going to stop talking for a little while. Good idea. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> a Northwest Orient Seattle operation manager, L. Lee, he approached the aircraft in street clothes so that Cooper wouldn't think that he was a police officer. I'm imagining with like a backwards cap. Yeah. Like, sup, dudes. <laughs> sup, DB. I'm one of you. I'm just like you. I'm just a normal youth. Hey, what's up, man? Do you want to go skateboarding later? Cool. <laughs> Meet you at the diner. <laughs> he raises scooters up to the side <laughs> of the plane. Hey. <laughs> want to go get cheeseburgers? Cool. Cool. Cool, man. Whatever. Gnarly, bro. Fight the power. <laughs> Peace out. <laughs> Shaka. <laughs> He delivered the um, namaste. He, <laughs> he delivered the cash-filled knapsack. Oh yeah, cool. Put it in a backpack. Two hundred in a backpack. Uh, and the parachutes to the flight attendant uh, Mucklo, who was another flight attendant, uh, via the plane's rear stairs. So the, the this plane, very special seven two seven, has got uh, rear stairs that actually fold down from underneath, underneath oh. the tail at the back. He hands all the money. Uh, once the delivery was completed, Cooper permitted all the passengers, uh, Flo Schaff and s- senior flight attendant Alice Hancock, to leave the plane. So they all got off. These people did not know that they'd been hijacked. They just thought that they were, had to wait a while on the tarmac, that kind of stuff. And a man's delivered a knapsack full of cash. No one's suspicious. And some random guy in sunglasses has said, yeah, you can all go. And, and they're like, yeah. Thanks, man. We know. Yeah, fuck off, 1D. <laughs> So most of the people have left, but this left on board with Cooper, uh, the pilot, Scott, uh, that flight attendant, Mucklow, the co-pilot, and the flight engineer aboard. So he left, he let Flo Schaff off. Flo Schaff off. But he kept Mucklow. Mucklow? What sort of name is that? Mucklow. Mucklow. How do you spell that? Muck, M-U-C-K. Oh. L-O-W. Mucklow. I hate it. (laughs) That is the ugliest name I've (laughs) ever heard. (laughs) And now seen written down. <laughs> that is an ugly name. <laughs> I'm, I'm assuming like Mucklow is very unattractive. <laughs> sounds like a James Bond enemy. Whereas Flo Schaff, I was imagining her to be a real babe. Yeah, yeah. Flo Schaff sounds really I can't hot. hope there'd be like this, this super cute romance. Like, like he'd be like, you can go. And she'd be like, I'm going to stay. That's yeah. what I imagined. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he turns around and she's putting a parachute on. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs> uh, whilst the plane refueled, Cooper told the pilot his plans. What he wanted was to fly towards Mexico City, which is quite a long way south, at the minimum airspeed possible without the aircraft stalling, which is approximately... (laughs) Fly as slow as you can without killing us. Which is approximately... This plane can fly at 190 kilometres per hour, which is quite slow for a plane. And at a maximum, its lowest altitude is uh, 10,000 feet, which is 3,000 metres. 190 k's? Like, I reckon if I really floored it, my car could do that. Yeah. Yeah, so this is a big jet, like yeah. you know, a big 727. Uh, he further specified that the landing gear remained deployed in takeoff, in the takeoff and landing position, so they never put the wheels up. He wanted the wing flaps to be lowered to 15 degrees and the cabin remain unpressurized. So he knows a lot about airplanes. He knows a lot. Okay, so maybe he's Air Force. Yeah, you were thinking something. he might be I, Army. I think he's some sort of spy. Yeah, I'm starting to think MI5. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. We assume he's American. Nobody's commented yet that he has a British accent. Maybe DB, could it be... DB9. He's James Bond. He could be Bond. (laughs) He's an Aston Martin. He's an Aston Martin. (laughs) He is a high-performance English motor car. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that he's a car. Anyway. (laughs) 
That's why no one's uh, <laughs> been suspicious this whole time. <laughs> There's a car on the plane. <laughs> Welcome to the flight, ladies and gentlemen, uh, to our special guest, the DB9 in the back left corner. It just keeps beeping demands at people. Beep, beep. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, the- it's got a novelty on. <laughs> <laughs> well, the car's beeped three times. I think we're all fl- free to leave the plane. <laughs> Uh, the co-p- co-pilot told Cooper the bad news, though, that they could only fly 1,600 kilometres without refuelling and wouldn't make it to Mexico, so it was decided that they would refuel in Reno, Nevada on the way down. Sure. Cooper directed the plane take off with the rear exit door open and its staircase extended so that those stairs underneath... Was just open. ...the flight. Northwest Home Office objected on the grounds that it was unsafe to take off with the staircase deployed. Cooper counted that it was indeed safe, but he would not argue the point. He would lower it himself once they were airborne. This guy is a fucking boss. <laughs> he's, he's like, and he's so polite and reasonable. You're wrong, but don't worry about it. What I love is that he's like, all right, guys, so here's my plan. I want to fly to Mexico. Here's all the specifications. Yeah. And the co-pilot's like, well, actually, okay, not a problem at all. One thing, we're not going to make it. How about we stop? Yep, no problem. Sounds great. Thank you for your cooperation. Honestly, that's great. I appreciate you you having that knowledge yeah. and sharing it with me. And, we, and we're going to sort out a much better solution. I really appreciate it. The your communication time. here, outstanding. Really good. I think everyone's learning together. Yeah. And that's so lovely, isn't it? Oh, God, this is a great terrorist great situation. Thing. I'm so intrigued as to why he wants to go so slowly. I mm. guess he wants to go low to be out of not be able to be tracked or something. We'll see. Okay, good. Uh, so the plane took off at 7.40 p.m., so a bit over two hours after it landed. Has he had anything to eat? It's a long time. I'm always thinking about mm. when I'm eating next, and this is stressing me out a bit. Had a meal and, when um, you're terrorizing, you really need something in your tum you got to keep you got to keep up the, the fluids and, and the food so yeah. that you can stay sharp. Yeah, because you, you've got to be on it. It's a high-pressure situation, and you don't want to be running low on um, you know your, your, your key Yeah. Uh, Nutrients. Nutrients. But you also don't want to just uh, just go for like a quick burst, like sugar, mm-hmm. because you'll just crash. You need low GI. You need low bananas. GI. That's why Were they, they aware of low GI in the, I don't in know. the 70s? It's a different time. Well, that's why they call him time. Vitamin DB Cooper. I'm loving all of the names we have for him so far. <laughs> he was big on. Vitamin DB. What a guy. Uh, so, anyway, so it took off at 7 40, two hours later. Uh, two fighter jets shattered the plane, one below and one above, so from the Air Force. So Cooper couldn't see them, but they couldn't fly at the low speed that the 727 could, so they had to keep doing loops and coming back. That's, oh so God, that's, that's why he wanted to go slow. After takeoff, uh, yeah. Cooper... Probably not, because they still, they're still watching him. Is that why? Or you got a, you got something bigger? I've got something bigger. Oh, it's exciting. I, I like when we guess something and Dave knows the answer and his like, face lights up. This is very exciting. After takeoff, Cooper told Mucklow the oh <laughs> Mucklow, God. unfortunately named. I cannot Flo. wait to this guy. Female Mucklow, I believe so. Mucklow. Yes, no, she. Yes, she was Mucklow. Yuck. He told her. Yucklow. <laughs> <laughs> I pictured a mustachioed man, to be honest. Mucklow. Really camp. No. Just like a just a just really a hairy, <laughs> like dumb guy. <laughs> not camp. Not not camp. Just a, like a dull. Just a dull human called really Mucklow. Boring. Yeah. The opposite of Cooper. Yes. Yeah. Yes, exactly. He's the Polar anti-Cooper. <laughs> yeah. No. Mucklow is uh, a female. She uh, she was told to join the rest of the crew in the cockpit and remain there with the door closed. So there you go. There is a door. There is a door. Not a curtain. <laughs> As she complied on the way up, Mucklow observed Cooper tying something around his waist. She later th- would later say that she thought it may have been the bag with the money. Sure. Makes sense. You want to take that with you? Oh, yeah. That's true. <laughs> I'm so bad with packing <laughs> that I reckon I'd be... That's the bag I leave behind. Oh, oh shit. You take all four parachutes yeah. Yeah. but leave behind the money. <laughs> that's exactly how I pack when I go away for a weekend or something. Yeah. I'm, I'm always getting there and we went, we've got four parachutes, probably only need two of these. Yeah. Or where's my bag of 200 grand? Silly duffer. It's with my. It's with the, all my jocks and socks. <laughs> I'm going to have to go down home. a safe way. Bloody hell. <laughs> Be great doing the doing the check. Like he's like, oh, I got the parachutes, got the two hundred grand. That's good. He's got like a little checklist. Yeah, <laughs> ticking it off. Uh, at, at approximately eight p.m., a warning light flashed in the cockpit, indicating that the rear air stair apparatus had been activated. The crew offered to help, but uh, Cooper refused. They were talking th- through intercom. They said, "Do you need any help back there?" And he's like, "I'm fucking." Any DB. refreshments? Can I get you a <laughs> t- cup of tea, coffee? 
Pringles. What, what do you Only want? nine dollars. Cooper's like, I'm I'm DB. I am all over this. Still, uh, in the cockpit, the crew soon noticed that a subjective change of air pressure indicating that the stair doors were open. So uh-huh. he's opened the back door underneath the plane. So he's da- he's like put himself out like in this little area at the back. It feels like they could someone could just close and lock a door. <laughs> yeah, all right. Which, Let's head back to Seattle. Which door? But no, they can't lock him out because if they do, then he can just set off the bomb. Ah, yeah, oh, yeah we keep bomb. forgetting about the bomb. Keep forgetting bomb. about the bomb. So he's back there with the bomb. Ah, uh, yeah, that makes sense. <laughs> with the bomb. Now I understand Did why you... they're cooperating. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that does make sense. I'm like, he is very charming. Yeah. But, but really, you know. 200 grand with, with no weapon? Well, a charm bomb. Did, have you gone with the bomb yet? You must have said the bomb. Several Super. times. Yeah, good. Several. I have not been paying attention. No, I think Dave's mainly done. I don't know if I've gone for De Bomb. I think they're probably referring to him as Dickbag Cooper because he's holding them captive. But... Yeah, sure. No. No, we, no, you've, no, never, no, no. you've never met DB, have you? <laughs> not Mucklo. She would never betray him. I'm so, his flow chef. <laughs> so the light's gone off. The cabin pressure has changed. They thought that Cooper had jumped out. So the pilot radioed the control tower to mark their spot so they could work out approximately where he jumped to. So they've marked it on a map. It was 8.13pm and they were travelling above the Lewis River in southwest Washington State. The crew was still very nervous as they were terrified that he would uh, jump out and then detonate the bomb and blow them all up. Why would he do that? Well, they would get rid of all the evidence, that kind of stuff. But they still fly all the way to Reno. 10.15pm, two hours later, they landed the 727 with the rear stairs still deployed. So they've just stayed in the cockpit together. FBI agents, state troopers, sheriff deputies, and Reno, Reno police surrounded the jet as it had not yet been determined whether Cooper was still aboard or not. But an armed search quickly confirmed that he was gone. Weird. He's gone. But I don't, I don't believe it. No. I'm not sure. Someone over the stairs. Yeah. He's sitting on the steps. He's down on his stoop. He's just hanging on to one of the, um, one of the wheels. And they just haven't noticed. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they walked past him. How many parachutes are there? Well, this is what remained. The FBI found 66 fingerprints and Cooper's... But he only has 10 fingers! (laughs) He was a shapeshifter. (gasps) Into lots of fingers. That's the shape he changed into. He's just a giant... Many fingers. Transform. (laughs) Select form. 66 fingers. (laughs) That's the noise he makes as he moves around. They just see 66 uh, fingers holding bundles of cash. (laughs) Parachuting to freedom. <laughs> he gets on the ground, transforms back into a suave looking guy in a suit, and walks to freedom. <laughs> I don't think that happened. I think he touched things. Still wearing the sunglasses. Yeah. There's a twin limb between his fingers. <laughs> No, they found 66 fingerprints and uh, Cooper's black clip-on tie. So he'd taken his tie off. Sure. Possibly to avoid being how strangled. Are they, how are they going to know who he is now? <laughs> <laughs> like he's... Where did he go? <laughs> it's like Clark Kent takes, yeah. <laughs> takes off his glasses and it's like, well, Clark, where? What? I don't understand. Where's the mother of Pearl? <laughs> no, that was on the, the tie. It was still his mother of Pearl tie clip. They also found two of the four parachutes one of which had been opened and two shroud lines cut away from its canopy, which is the actual parachute part. Some people think that he may have cut those off to tie the money to himself. Sure. Might have used those as rope. And that was it. Apart from that, he was completely gone. Local police and FBI agents, of course, immediately began uh, questioning possible suspects. One of the first was an Oregon man with a minor police record named D.B. Cooper. He was (laughs) contacted by... I wonder why they got onto him. (laughs) He was contacted by Portland police on the off chance that the hijacker had used his real name or the same alias as in a previous crime, which would have been incredibly stupid, but maybe you did. His involvement was quickly ruled out, but an inexperienced wire service operator rushing to meet an immediate deadline who was wiring the report to the new- his newspaper confused the eliminated suspect's name with the pseudonym used by the hijacker, Dan Cooper. So he wrote... D.B. Cooper, which is that suspect. And, sure. and then all the newspapers published D.B. Cooper as the alias. Ah. And that's why, to history, he's known as D.B. Cooper. So they've never found him. Even though Dan Cooper is what he said his name was. Right. 
Then they go to go look for him, right? Uh, it was very difficult to work out exactly where Cooper had landed, as uh, if the area they thought he had parachuted into was even slightly off to where he had, then it would alter. Yeah. The because they don't. Point. They, nobody actually saw him jump, so they reckon no. like, okay, air pressure. Uh, has changed. We reckon he's probably jumped, but he could have just like opened it and sat there for a bit, checked his Facebook, and then jumped. Yeah, so he could have waited ten. minutes. Which could to... alter it a lot. Yeah, exactly. So they just assumed eight thirteen was when he jumped. Also, they didn't have Facebook in the seventies, so oh. that was the joke there. Kind of similar to your terrible joke before about a team that nobody cares about. Do go on. <laughs> Love when we all uh, turn on each other when one of our jokes doesn't land. <laughs> yeah. Like, that was great. You guys are fuckheads. Wait, what? No, I've no, never said a good great. joke. What was yours? I was coughing. <laughs> <laughs> Coughed and I missed it. <laughs> Give it to me once once more. No. Speaking of landing, another important variable was the length of time he remained in free fall before pulling his ripcord. So sure. he may have dangled for ages or he may have... Oh, gone man. straight away. That's, so that's so smart. He did variables. all those things on purpose. Mm. But so that's only if he didn't succeed in opening the parachute at all, yeah. right? He could be dead. So have you said why he wanted the plane to go so slowly? It was just so he could jump. Just out. so he could jump. Jump out the back. Would do you think the authorities knew that? But he was. That, I think they thought he was planning to jump. But neither of the Air Force fighter pilots shadowing the plane above or below saw, him. saw anything exit the airliner or. Either visually or on their radar, they didn't pick anything up. And they didn't see a parachute open. But I would say it was at night, it's extremely limited visibility, lots of cloud. And he would have seen them doubling back, so he would have known when to go, maybe, based on... I think that they were too low for him to see them. Oh, right, okay. So they were, like, flying very low and very Maybe he landed on one of them. (laughs) He's still on the roof. (laughs) Check your roof. Check your roof. Also, he's wearing entirely black clothing, so it's difficult to see him in the night. But can you just go skydiving in normal clothes? You know, like, wouldn't you get a bit chilly? <laughs> if anything, he's got a bit of a cold now, doesn't he? Well, yes, I, have, I did read that when he opened the back stairs, the uh, wind chill would have been up at that height, would have been at night, would have been up to like minus 30 degrees. That's so cold. It's really it's cold. Pretty cold. That's pretty cold. So that's what I think. Fahrenheit? He, uh, Celsius. Celsius, oh, that's, that's cold. cold. It gets like 10 degrees here and I'm bloody chilly. Yeah, 10, 10 degrees. I'm putting on a, a, a cardigan at least, at if least. not a jacket. Yeah, I if reckon not a hoodie. A beanie. I'd put on a hoodie oh, and a hoodie's scarf not bad. at that point. Yeah. Hoodie and scarf, definitely long trousers. Oh, easily. Okay. And I, he I'd was be putting definitely... socks and shoes on too. Yeah. Well, he was wearing loafers, let's not forget. Loafers. Ah. So his feet are fine. That's good. <laughs> Uh, also a hampering visibility and a challenge for Cooper himself was that at 8.13pm, if that was the time he jumped, the plane was actually travelling through a rainstorm. Oh no. Now he's definitely got a cold. Maybe even the flu. Ooh. That's not how flu works, Jess. No, nah, I think it is though. Well, you are a medical doctor. Science says yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, both the FBI and the sheriff's deputies searched the area around the river. They thought he would have landed around on foot and by helicopter. Daughters' all searches of local farmhouses were carried out. They ran patrol boats on the river. It's nearby lakes and reservoirs. No trace of Cooper, nor any of the equipment presumed to have uh, left the aircraft with him was found. They even used a submarine to search the 200 foot or 61 metre depths of a local lake, Lake Merwin. What, so what's the, area, what's the area they think he's landed in? So a forest in Washington State. This guy's fucking so cool. He's so cool. He's so cool. Uh, did you mention at the start like how old they reckon he is? So mid forties. Oh, that's hard. I'm imagining like not not silver fox, but like salt and pepper. You know? Oh yeah. <laughs> that's Ooh. creepy. Sorry. I can show. You, I can show you a maybe DB down to bone, down, <laughs> down to bone Cooper. Do you think? Yeah. Dirty boy Cooper. Oh yeah, dirty boy Cooper. Oh, so they didn't find him in 1971. So remember, it was November. 24th, 1971. Then in early 1972, shortly after the spring thaw, teams of FBI agents aided by 200 army soldiers along with Air Force personnel, National Guard and other volunteers conducted another search throughout the grounds for 18 days. Then they did an additional 18-day search in April. So 36 days they've they've looked everywhere. The only thing they found was uh, two local women stumbled upon a skeleton in an abandoned structure. It was later identified as the remains of a female teenager who had been abducted and murdered several weeks before. Oh, so awful. Oh, but it had nothing. At first, they were like skeleton. Wow. Several weeks, and she's already a skeleton. Yeah, that's. Is that, that the mystery? Like, yeah, that seems like 
pretty. F- uh, science says that's fast. Do you think DB but, uh, ate all of her flesh and, uh, and muscle and wore it as some sort of neat suit? He ate it and then wore it. Dave, come on, let's keep it realistic, please. Matthew, DB would never do that. No, he's true. a cool guy. That's true. He just sip a bourbon and I don't soda. know what I was thinking. Take it back. I take that back. Thank you. So I will say that nothing to do with the hijacking was found. Cooper had vanished without a trace. So cool. What a cool guy. But so the theory is, if you get two hundred thousand dollars, you sp- and you get you spend it, right? Yeah. Um. <laughs> <laughs> nah. Uh, I don't know. I'd go back to my call centre job, I reckon. Yeah. I'd just build a hut out of it in the forest. Mm. Live in it. Live in the money. I'm in the money, I'd say. <laughs> DB in the money. In the money. In the anyway. bank. Da, da bank. Da bank. Cooper. Da bank. Cooper. Straight to da bank. Yeah. In late 1971, the FBI distributed a list of the ransom serial numbers that they'd taken photos of to banks, casinos, racetracks, and other businesses that routinely conduct significant cash transactions. Mm-hmm. And uh, they also gave it to law enforcement agencies around the world in case you were spending it overseas. The airline even offered a 15% reward of any recovered money that people found. Oh, wow. So they're trying to find the money. Then in 1972, also, uh, serial numbers were released to the public. And later that year, two men used a counterfeit $20 bill printed with Cooper serial numbers on it to swindle $30,000 from a Newsweek reporter in exchange for an interview with the man they falsely claimed was the hijacker. Oh, wow. So that's the downside of letting the public know the serial numbers. These guys made fake cash yeah. and said, yeah, we got DB Cooper. You can interview him for 30 grand. <laughs> it was completely fake. Huh. He's my mum. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'm DB. <laughs> it's a dog. <laughs> He's just out the back in his kennel. Go have a chat. I do uh, people also offered rewards for found notes, but Cooper was still nowhere. Then in 1975, the uh, airline Northwest Orient's insurer complied with an order from the Supreme Court and they paid the airlines a $180,000 claim on the ransom money. So they're insured for that. They're insured for ransom money? So the real story- loser in this story <laughs> is the insurance company. Good. Fuck them. You know who I hate almost as much as accountants? Insurance companies. Go get fucked. Just, you know that now we're all just paying higher premiums because of people like DB. So he's cost us all money in a way. What do you think? Why about do you keep turning DB on DB? Now? What's your problem with DB? Are you jealous of DB? Yes. Who Fair enough, because he's the coolest guy in the world, Who and you'll it? never be that cool. He's a cool guy. Doesn't mean you have to shit all over him, Matt. Hey Jess, who says I'm not DB? <laughs> So we all love DB. He's a clever guy, but he was not the first to attempt to hijack a plane, nor was he the last. Two weeks prior, for example, a Canadian man named Paul Joseph Sini hijacked an Air Canada flight over Montana, but he was overpowered by the crew when he put down his shotgun to strap on the parachute he had brought with him. Uh, Uh, Shotgun's no good. You want a bomb. You want a bomb. You want a bomb. Also, he bought his own parachute. (laughs) Amazing. Then in the uh, 12... So, D.B. Cooper, this is a massive news story in the U.S. because it's a big mystery at the time. Everyone wants to know what happened to him. In the 12 months after he made headlines for his crime, 15 hijackers attempted similar plans with guns or a bomb but were all either arrested and, and to parachute out. But they were all either arrested when they landed or a couple of days after. Well, that, I think that's because they didn't have the crazy brain of D.B. D.B. sounds like he was a bit of a genius. Bit of a genius. Also, the airlines before that, before 1973, uh, when they invented universal luggage searches, before that, no one got searched at all. So you could bring literally any weapon onto a plane. Say, a, like a bomb. A bomb, a, a shotgun. shotgun. One of them Amazing. hijacked a plane with a submachine gun that he had hidden in his bag and then parachuted out, but was caught. So it's absolutely crazy. But so they started learning their lesson. The Two years later, in 1973, and they started searching everyone's bags. So that's that Two mainly stopped. Two years later, I know oh, exactly. There, there were no further Cooper in, um, imitators until July 11th, 1980, when uh, a guy called Glenn Tripp sees the Northwest flight, also at Seattle Tacoma Airport, demanding six hundred thousand dollars. Do you think this is DB? No, nah, he wouldn't choose a shit name like Glenn Tripp. Glenn Tripp. Fuck off, Glenn. But he did want more. He wanted 600 grand. He wanted two parachutes and the assassination of his boss. <laughs> oh, Glenn. Glenn. What a demand. You're a dickhead. 
<laughs> They're not assassinating a boss for you, Gwen. <laughs> then, uh, <laughs> come so on, good. Gwen. And, and tell my mum that I won't clean up my room. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> you get it in writing that I won't have to clean up my room. I want six hundred thousand dollars, I want two parachutes, and I want some biscotti. <laughs> <laughs> None of that shit in a can. I want homemade biscotti and a sippy cup. So this he's obviously crazy, right? But after a ten hour standoff he was apprehended. But then in July nineteen eighty three, while still on probation, so he got arrested, they let him out. Sure. Three years later. He hijacked the same Northwest flight. <laughs> nah, I'll do it again. This I reckon ta- I got it. This time demanded to be flown to Afghanistan. <laughs> but when the plane landed in Portland to refuel, he was shot and killed by FBI agents. Oh. So there you go. Glenn. It doesn't end well for Glenn. <sighs> it, no, nor should it. Glenn's a dickhead. I like, you, you know, DB was just this mysterious man. Glenn's like, well, this is where I work. <laughs> yeah. I want you to kill my boss. Kill my boss. Um, do you want, what else do you need to know about me to make this why, hard? Why do you want to kill your boss? He's, I don't know. He doesn't. I asked for the day off and he said I couldn't have it. I was said I'm going to go terrorising. <laughs> also, don't tell him where I am. He thinks I'm sick. <laughs> oh, shit. Just, Just kill, kill him. him. Just kill him. <laughs> kill him before he asks any questions. Hey, don't you think it's interesting we assumed his boss was male? It's 1980. <laughs> They, they were the times, Jess. You're right. Sorry. And we also assumed that uh, Glenn Tripp was a male as well. So sure. you know, Glenn, Glenn Close Glenn is Close. female. Goes, goes both ways there, it does. Jess. Well played. Thank you. <laughs> but also, the boss was a dickhead, obviously, so that's why I thought it was a man. Yeah. Because huh? you wouldn't ever want to kill a lady. <laughs> that's not what I said. <laughs> well, no, hang on. What? <laughs> You always was, want to kill ladies. I was like pushing the equal opportunity and it, <laughs> it really messed me up. <laughs> That's, look, Jess, I'm not saying. Oh, fucking Fighting hell. for equality, Matt. I think bosses, male or female, should be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so those are the copycat crimes. But back to DB. They didn't find any trace of him until 1978, a placard containing instructions for lowering the aircraft stairs from that 727 was found by a deer hunter on the logging road about uh, 21 kilometres east of Castle Rock in Washington, well north of where of Lake Merwin, where that submarine had searched. But, Seven years later. But still within the Basic Path. So mm. that, the instructions are clearly just blown out the window. Yeah. Uh, at the stairs. <laughs> at the stair holes. <laughs> oh, at the stair holes. Big old stair holes. <laughs> Technical term. Then in February 1980, an eight-year-old boy named Brian Ingram. Brian Ingram. He was vacationing with his family on the Columbian River about uh, 14 kilometers downstream from Vancouver, Washington. He uncovered three packets of the Cooper ransom money. Oh. They were significantly disintegrated, but still bundled in rubber bands. Oh, he did. And were found when Ingram was raking the sandy riverbanks to make a campfire. Oh, I want him to be dead. I want him to. Be, I want him to have just dropped him. I want him to have gone on to become Donald Trump or some sort of president. Mm. FBI technicians examined the money and confirmed that the money was indeed a portion of the ransom. Two packets of the one hundred twenty dollar bills each, and a third packet of ninety. So ten had fallen out. All arranged in the exact same order as they were when they were given to Cooper. There was a big search. They searched the bank for the rest of the money, but none of it was ever found. But this raised a lot of questions. First of all, how did the money get there? Mm. It may have floated there naturally. An Army Corps engineer hydrologist noted that the bills had disintegrated in a rounded fashion and were matted together, indicating that they'd been deposited by river actions. They just floated down, as opposed to being deliberately buried. Like if someone... Lands, ah. buries it to get the money later. If this is true, it means Cooper never landed near Lake Merwin as originally thought, because that is downstream rather than up. Ah. The money's not gonna, so the money's not going to flow up. So they may have been looking in the wrong place. But this does not explain the 10 bills missing from one packet, nor was there a logical reason that three packets would have remained together after separating from the rest of the money. If, if you had died and dropped all of the money, why would three packets stay together and then the rest of it? Sure. Yeah. Unless he's purposefully dropped it to send him on a wild goose chase. Oh my chase. goodness, this guy. Well, the river was, <laughs> th- that river was dredged in 1974, so it's likely that the bills arrived there after 1974. 
What? Three years after the hijacking. Yeah. Hmm. Oh, it's S- exciting. Some... If, if if those bills could talk. <laughs> if they could. <laughs> what an adventure they've been oh on. My goodness. Some surmise that the money had been found at a distant location by someone or possibly even a wild animal, carried to the riverbank, reburied there. There was also the possibility that the money had been found on the riverbank earlier before the dredging and buried in a superficial sand layer at a later time. So someone may have come across the money and buried it for later. So Who might... buries money? Well, if you Next to a river as well. I don't know. If you find like $30,000 in bills... And I'd bury it in something so it doesn't get all damaged. I mean, our money's plastic, so it would be a bit, it would last a bit better. But theirs isn't, is it? Isn't it paper? So it's just going to disintegrate anyway. So why would you bury it? I don't know why you'd bury it. I don't know why. Well, the sheriff of Colwitz County, who had been part of the search, he proposed that Cooper may have accidentally dropped a few of the bum- bundles when he was on the air stair mm-hmm. before he parachutes down, which then blew off and he jumped uh, and then they just fell into the river. Yeah, that could it's make sense. It's a possibility. Sense. So then Cooper kept the rest of the money, maybe. Uh, in 1986, after a lot of negotiation, the recovered bills were divided equally between the boy who found them, Brian Ingram, and Northwest Orient's insurer, those people that... Oh, think. sure. Yeah. Uh, the FBI retained some examples as evidence. Ingram, so the eight-year-old boy, sold 15 of his bills at auction in 2008 for $37,000. I reckon oh, Brian wow. Ingram is D.B. Cooper's son. 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 Yeah. And another smart cookie. That's so obviously there's still a lot of interest in this mystery in America if, if people are, people are still spending that kind of money on Which means they never found him. Well the three bundles of twenty dollar bills <gasps> found on Tina Bar, which is that sandbar in nineteen eighty, the only evidence ever found after the hijacking. The simplest explanation that Cooper landed on or near Tina Bar would require that the published flight path was off by many miles. The jump timing would have to be off, so they miscalculated. And the pilots were not uh, navigating in their normal manner, so they didn't properly work out on the map where he jumped. There was currently no good data indicating that the flight path and timing of Cooper's jump were off enough for him to have him landed in that area. So he probably didn't land where the money was. Short story there. Mm -hmm. So, there are a lot of theories as to what happened to old mate D.B. Cooper the mystery part. FBI agents believe that uh, Cooper was familiar with the Seattle area as he made comments about that stuff. He may have been an Air Force veteran based on testimony that he recognised uh, that Air Force base on the ground and uh, his accurate comment to where it was 20 minutes from the airport, which is something a detail most civilians would not know or comment upon. Though DB is a bit of a mystery, so who knows. So yeah, it seemed weird that he was giving stuff away like that, but obviously it didn't matter. Yeah. Uh, they believe he was a, a careful and shrewd planner because he asked for four parachutes, mm-hmm. that thing that I said before. He knew the plane. That 727, that's the only type of plane that has the stairs at the back that you can open whilst you're in the air. So he knew that. Yeah, he, um, and he also knew that that plane could fly slowly so he could jump out. Uh, in 2009, Tom Kay, who was a paleontologist from a museum in Seattle, put together a team of citizen sleuths to look into the case. They did a bunch of experiments and came to some conclusions. And there's this great website, which I'll link to, about the citizen sleuths. And there's all this extra info. I kind of get obsessed with the case through it. You can look through their findings. So he collaborated with some of the FBI's or evidence and also came up with his own stuff. Uh, he concluded that Cooper's meticulous planning may have also extended to the timing of his operation and even his choice of attire. This is a quote. The FBI searched but couldn't find anyone who disappeared that weekend. So you'd think that if he did die, then someone would be like, oh, because I had a sketch of what he looked like. Oh, yeah, my friend at work didn't come back on yeah. Monday. Yeah. Uh, it suggested that the perpetrator may have uh, simply returned to his normal occupation on Monday. Oh, my God. With or without the money. If he'd lost the money, you'd still, you couldn't tell anyone. You'd just go back to work on Monday. So if you were planning to go back to work on Monday, then you would need as much time as possible to get out of the woods, find transportation, and then get back home without anyone noticing. The very best time for this to happen is a four-day weekend, which is when he jumped out. He jumped out just before Thanksgiving. He's got four days to get back to work. Siri not available. Where is D.B. Cooper? (laughs) (laughs) It's on airplane mode. How did that happen? Um, This is bullshit. (laughs) <laughs> Where is she? Where is he? Uh, furthermore, if he was planning ahead, he would knew he'd had to hitchhike out of the woods, and it'd be much easier to get picked up in a suit and tie 
rather than old blue jeans. So if you're well-dressed, people are more likely to pick you up. That's the theory there. And he was very well-dressed. Wow. Yeah, but then you're also, you stand out. Like, why is this guy, Why is this well-dressed man hitchhiking? Mm. And then when it was all over the news, you'd be like, well, hang on a second. I saw that very well-dressed well, man. I that guy. Hmm. Uh, the other thing that these guys found was in November 2011K, the paleontologist announced that particles of pure titanium had been found on Cooper's tie that had been left behind. He ex- Kay explained that titanium, which was very rare in the 1970s, was found at the time only in metal fabrication or production facilities or chemical companies that use it. So the findings suggested that uh, Cooper may have been a chemist or someone working with metal or an engineer or a manager of a metal plant. So that's why, because it would be really strange for someone to have that kind of metal found on them in the 70s. Or a spy. Mm. Or a metal spy. <laughs> or a robot. Or oh, a transformer. He was a transformer. Yeah, he was a transformer. He lands in the woods, gets to a road, turns into a DB9, away he goes. Yep, from his 62-finger <laughs> formation. <laughs> well, the FBI, they think that he died. They think that he didn't make it. So yeah, they think despite... They wish. They w- they'd want to say that. They wouldn't. That's my opinion. They'd want to say that. Despite his careful planning and attention to detail... The FBI believes that Cooper lacked crucial skydiving skills and experience. They originally thought that Cooper was an experienced jumper, perhaps maybe even a paratrooper or, or a, someone from the army. But uh, they did another investigation in 2006 and concluded that this was simply not true. No experienced parachutist would have jumped in the pitch black night in the rain with a 200 mile hour wind rushing against your face wearing loafers and a trench coat. Like you were saying, Jess... Most people, when they jump, wear a lot of safety gear. Mm -hmm. He wasn't even wearing a helmet. The FBI say that that was simply too risky. But, like, the whole thing is ridiculously risky, right? I reckon because he knew the risks, because he was really experienced, that's why he knew he could get away with it, right? Mm -mm. And why he knew that, like, everyone, like, helmets. And what else? did They wanted him wearing, like, knee pads or something. (laughs) Come on, Ross. Come on. You'd look a bit silly getting on a plane with a helmet on. You reckon that might give the game away? More so than the sunnies. Yeah. Oh, I was, he's definitely pitch black at night, skydiving through the sunnies. dark, sunnies on. The other fact that they argue is that he also missed that his uh, reserve chute was only for training and being sewn shut. In the uh, oh. panic to get the four parachutes to him from the skydiving school, they accidentally gave him a dud parachute. Shit. And that he picked that one as his backup. Right. But... I don't know. Like, if you're on a plane, you want to jump out of the plane, even if you are experienced, you'd make, you could make mistakes like that, couldn't you? Good. You'd panic, so I'm thinking. But the FBI has argued from the start that Cooper did not survive the jump. But where's the body? Where's the body? Or even part of the parachute. None of that was ever found. But the money was never used. And the money was never used. So Do they know that for sure? Well, they tr- were tracking it. It's never been picked up by casinos or banks. Right. So he could just be using it for groceries. He could just still be living off it, yeah, being his own be. bank. There's been a, a bunch of suspects as to who D.B. Cooper really is. A lot of people have come forward, especially after relatives die and said, you know what, my uncle, he was D.B. Mm-hmm. There's been a lot of people have come forward. Most of them ruled out. The one that I think is most likely is that I read about in 2003, a Minnesota man named Lyle Christensen, after watching a documentary on the Cooper hijacking, he became convinced that his late brother, Kenneth Christensen, was D.B. Cooper. So this is... I'll read his stats and you tell me if you think he fits the profile. Christensen was uh, enlisted in the army in 1944. He was trained as a paratrooper. He made a... He didn't... He was never actually deployed, but he'd made occasional training jumps. So he had a bit of parachuting experience. Uh, he joined the Northwest Orient uh, Airline in 1954 as a mechanic. Oh. And subsequently became a flight attendant... Uh, based in Seattle, so he knew a lot about planes. But would somebody have recognised him I think then? That he would if he worked for that thing. He was 45 years old at the time of hijacking, but he was a bit shorter, five foot eight, than the six foot. It's a fair bit shorter. Claim of well, they said five ten to six foot, so mm. five eight. Five eight's kind of short. I though. feel like DB walks taller as I, well. Yeah, I reckon five eight's too short. That confidence, that charm. Yeah. he would appear a bit taller. And his loafers had heels as yeah. well. <laughs> Platform loafers on. Yeah. I love this. Christensen, the suspect, as did the hijacker, smoked. Oh, hello. Displayed, Everybody did in the 70s. I yeah, know. Displayed a fondness for bourbon. Okay, well. well doesn't mean too much, does no. it? No. He was also left handed. Yeah! yeah. 
<laughs> Left-handed. Sinister. He was the sinister man. But th- we never said that DB was. Well, evidence uh, photos of Cooper's black tie show the clip tie from the, applied on the left side, suggesting that he was a left-hander. Oh, that's why I like him. See, from the beginning, I liked him. Yeah, now it makes did. sense. Flight, uh, flight attendant Flo Schaff told a reporter that photos of Kenneth Christensen fit her memory of the hijacker's appearance more closely than any other suspect she's been shown. But, but it can't be it has Kenneth. Been, but 30 years has passed. Right. It can't be hard, be... hard for Flo Schaff to remember. He's not a Kenneth. Someone that sexy cannot be a Kenneth. Kenneth has... Ne- like, no Kenneth has ever done anything cool. Certainly never had sex. <laughs> <laughs> and appeal. DB has had heaps of sex. Oh, so, too much sex. Appeal. <laughs> appeal. Uh, Kenneth reportedly purchased a house within, within, with cash a few months after the hijacking. While dying of cancer in 1940, he told his brother, there is something you should know, but I cannot tell you. What a fucking tease. No, that's bullshit. That is, his yeah, brother's his just brother like, he's just clutching some... at straws now. Though I will say, after Kenneth's death, his family members discovered gold coins and a valuable stamp collection, along with $200,000 in bank accounts. Holy fuck. $200,000? Where was he for Thanksgiving in 1971? Anybody remember? Was was Uncle Kenneth around for that Thanksgiving, or was that the Thanksgiving he was away on holiday? Hmm. I love a mystery, but I hate one that doesn't have a a nice... Oh, I'm so solution. frustrated yeah. right now. This I, f- is... I, I, I can I know, hardly I'm... sit in this chair right now. I feel very uneasy. They also found a folder of Northwest Orient news clippings, which began about the time he was hired in the 50s and stopped just prior to the date of the hijacking. I mean, a lot Despite... of this does sound pretty good, right? Mm. Despite the fact that the hijacking was by far the most momentous news event in the airline's history ever. So he didn't cut anything about that out, but he cut out everything else about the airline. Yeah. Christensen continued to work part-time for the airline for many years after 1971. So you think that someone would recognise him, but apparently never clipped another Northwest news story. Weird. Uh, so there was a book published about Kenneth Christensen, and there was a lot of publicity about that, but the FBI addressed that standard. Uh, they stood by their position that he cannot be considered a prime suspect. They signed a poor match to eyewitness physical description, level of skydiving expertise that they predicted was above... The actual DB Cooper. FBI sound like like um, stubborn kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nah, nah, I can't be, can't, can't be. be. But it sounds like it, it probably is. Nah, nah. I don't. I reckon. said it isn't. <laughs> yeah. Just uh, three final things to follow. Not fun facts, but uh, just. <sighs> you better just have the answer. You better just be like, well, actually, I found him and he's here with us today. He's hiding under the table. Classic DB. <laughs> Classic DB. Matt uh, checked. In the wake... So I told you about those multiple copycat hijackings the year after in 1972. In the wake of that, the um, the FAA required that all Boeing 727s, the one with the lower mm-hmm. aircraft, be fitted with the device that was later dubbed the Cooper Vane, <gasps> Cooper Vane which present, prevents the lowering of the aircraft during flight. So no one could jump out of those stairs anymore. Oh, they named it after him. Several air- That's how charming he was. <laughs> Several airlines uh, elected to abandon the use of the air stair entirely and welded the door shut. So you couldn't go through the back anymore. What I love about him being known as D.B. Cooper is that it was one error one time by a journalist. Yeah. yeah. There is a D.B. Cooper. Yeah, and he's fine. He's a normal person. I know, he's not even... He's Dan Cooper. No one ever went, we should probably fix this. No, no, just leave it at DB. We've done it now. We wrote one article, so I don't see how we could possibly fix this. It was very strange, isn't it? Everyone Mm. still calls him DB 45 years later. So weird. And uh, the most recent note on the story, in late April 2013, Earl Cossey, the owner of the skydiving school that furnished the four parachutes Mm. given to Cooper, was found dead in his home in the suburb of Seattle. (sighs) His death was ruled a homicide due to blood force trauma to the head. The oh. perpetrator remains unknown. Conspiracy theorists immediately began pointing out possible links to the Cooper case. But authorities no. responded that they had no reason to believe that they had such a link exists. And I think that that was the work of one Pharaoh Tutankhamun. I was thinking Pharaoh too. Curse. Yeah, because it, as if it would be DB, he's not the murdering type. He is not. He's he let everybody off the plane. Charming. He's a bloody charmer. Nah, that's silly. Hot for DB. This is the final note on DB in pop culture, obviously. Um, this is a very famous story in the 1970s. A lot of books and movies and things have been made out of this story. Uh, Cooper has been used in a number of storylines of popular TV shows, such as Prison Break. Ah, oh, cool. Numbers. 
as well as the 4400 TV series. But this is the, uh, the final note. Remember I asked you if you've ever heard the name D.B. Cooper at the start of the show. In the 1990 hit television series Twin Peaks, you ever seen Twin Peaks? No, I haven't. No, I haven't. I've, I was talking about it just yesterday because I saw Mulholland Drive the other day. Oh. And that was a frustrating fucking... I studied movie. it at uni. I, I enjoyed it, but it was like this story. It was like... What wait, is happening? What? I know. This is it? I'm afraid that the, this story that I've told you today is pretty David Lynch. It has no, no real good story. But in the uh, Twin Peaks, which is a great show, the main character is FBI Special Agent Dale Bartholomew Cooper, oh. who's named after D.B. Cooper. Oh, that's cool. That's a fun fact. That, that would have been more fun, fun if you had also if you were both fans of the yeah, show. Yeah, and then we'd be like, whoa! I, I believe I'm going to be a fan of it. Well, Dave, that was very interesting, but at the same time, and so no offense, I'm so unsatisfied. Is, but isn't that? I feel uneasy. You've ruined my day. I will say that this is the yeah. only hijacking in U.S. history that has not been solved. Are you kidding? Wow. Every other one, they know who it is. This guy, to this day, I'll show you a photo of the drawing, which I will be tweeting out. This is uh, the attractive man that you. Oh drew. yeah, he's a bit yeah. of a babe. He is a bit of a babe. Yeah, he's There's also right. a. Oh, with Im- the glasses. Images of him with sunglasses. Oh, I'll be oh, tweeting those Mama. Out. Goodness me. Oh. He's popular. He's like Ned Kelly. Somewhere in the US, they, <laughs> they have like an annual like Cooper Day. They do not. Yeah. Let's go. Because he, he, he never harmed anyone. He never hurt anybody. It, it, it was like a victimless crime apart from the fucking insurance companies. And good fucking. <laughs> and you know who, who also works for insurance companies? Probably accountants. Oh, my God. Fuck all of you. I bet they employ quite a few. Yeah, quite a few. Probably doesn't but if it was kenneth and he paid for his house in cash well firstly you should be suspicious if somebody pays for a house yeah, in yeah. cash so you'd think you'd maybe run over those uh those bills a couple no, no. Of times. um 20 dollar um, notes too no uh thank you for for this information but no definitely not him because someone uh said he looked slightly different so definitely not him but thank thank you yeah. for letting us know that's Fuck fucked. off, FBI. Yeah. Pieces of shit. But there's been, like, that was the one that I thought was most intriguing. There's been dozens of people that have suggested or come forward, but the FBI has always ruled them out for some, one reason or another. But I like to think that uh, he made it, because if he did... Well, th- I'm in two camps on it, because if he did live, why didn't he spend the money? Yeah. Possibly he just lost it. He dropped it on the way down. Which sucks. Which sucks, but that's definitely a possibility. And that's why some of the money washed up. Mm-hmm. You know, it could have been rummaged through... By a wild animal, or when yep. it hit, hit trees, it split into little bags. And uh, the other thing is, if he did die, then why didn't they find the one parachute and his body? Yeah, they did a massive search. Even now, like the hunter found that plate. So someone, the people go through forests. Someone it's will possible. stumble upon his body. Yeah. Oh man, well, I, I hope mean, that might be ridiculous. I have no idea what this train's like, but I reckon he made it. Why? Um, why couldn't he have just spent the money bit by bit? Like you're saying, he didn't spend it because he didn't go uh, launder it at a casino or a bank. Bank, yeah, but maybe... I think they, this, they pr- probably, of the 10,000 notes... Of they the, end up at a bank they sometime. End, exactly, that's the thing. So, yeah, like, yeah, sure. a shop would take Sorry, it to the bank and saying, then they'd be able to trace it back. I did, what I was saying there was really dumb. No, not really dumb. <laughs> Pretty and, dumb. And as technology improves now, that I think they probably have alarms on... Yeah, yeah, They yeah, yeah. probably scan each note as it the, comes yeah, through. Yeah, so the bank records all the... All the um yeah, the numbers, the serial numbers and yeah, and they've all been marked. They've all been photo. I don't know. It's amazing. But when I was reading the story, I was like, "This," and and then I was like, "He's not going to jump out, is he?" He jumped out, and then he disappeared. Oh, so cool! So cool. That's a great story. That's the mystery of DB Cooper. That was for you, Brett. I hope you enjoyed that mystery. Yeah, I reckon Brett would have enjoyed that. I never. That never even went in the actual hat. You just siphoned that one off for yourself. You low dog. Dude, I got an email and thought LD. <laughs> L.D. Warnicky. L.D. Warnicky. No, good one. All right. And it's good because then we had no idea, so that's great. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you well didn't done. have a chance to look into it because I just secretly did it myself. But if you want to get an idea into the hat, you can email us, uh, do go on pod at gmail.com or on Twitter. We like getting those. We uh, keep a record of all the suggestions we get on Twitter. At do go on pod is our handle. We're on <laughs> Facebook as well. You can send us a message. Cecil uh, sent one to me directly during the week, so maybe I can siphon one off as oh, well. Oh, yeah, good oh, one. I've already put in the hat, though. You guys can all see it. Bloody hell. I haven't checked the hat recently if you want to delete it. <laughs> yeah, you, I haven't checked the hat either. The, the go- E-hat. The, the Google, e- Doc hat. Google Doc hat. <laughs> that we are all we will all don at one stage. But uh, that is it. And uh, the day that this episode comes out is Wednesday, 
and it is the opening night of the Melbourne International Comedy Festival. Woohoo! If you are in Melbourne, we do employ you to go out and see some shows. Three and a half weeks of absolute comedy bonanza. Yeah. We're all doing shows separately. Yep. Um, Matt, do you want to tell us about your show? Yeah, mine doesn't start for a couple of weeks from when this goes out, so... But, you know, tickets are on sale. <laughs> oh, my goodness, they are they big time? Yes, they are. And Tuxedo sh- Cat. Yes. Show's called Logistical Nightmare. It's with Andy Matthews. A much funnier and smarter man than me, so... Uh, I agree with one of those points, but not the other. Oh, Which so one is it? I, not true. He's very good. And uh, so are you, though. I want to throw in <laughs> something else. He's also better looking. He is, yeah. No is doubt he taller? About it. Uh, no, I think I, I think I edge him okay, for height. Okay, so you got that. There you He's go, less red. He's yeah, less, less red. red. He's more of a blonde. He's a blonde. Anyway. And I know he listens to this show too, so I, Andy, I think Andy, you're, great. you're a babe. <laughs> you're great. And uh, okay, great. So that's at the Tuxedo Cat for the second half of the festival? Second so half of the festival, yeah. 7.15 every night by Wednesdays. Wednesdays, weird night off. Yeah, Tuxedo Cat... They don't follow your rules. Fair enough. Well, historically, Wednesday is the toughest night of the festival. That's why. That's smart. Very smart. It's very quiet. How about you, JP? I am doing a show called Comedy Zone, which is put on by the Comedy Festival, where they pick five of the best up-and-comers. So I'm doing that. It starts tomorrow, and it runs all the way through the festival, so you can come along to that. So 22 Um, shows, five comedians for the price of one. That's up at Trades Hall, Trades Hall at uh, 8.15 every night. So come on down. There you go. I am doing a show. It's a quiz show. It's called Facty Fact versus the Audience. It is on at the Imperial Hotel. Three different guests every night competing against the audience in a comedy game show that I run. It's a lot of fun. And uh, that's for the first half of the festival. So opening night is tonight. If you listen to this the day it comes out until April 3rd at 10.15pm. Come on down. going to be a gay old time. Had by one and all. And Jess and Matt, you're going to be on the show together? Yeah. yeah. We'll, we'll tweet everyone out. Uh, the date of that, Can I you guess. Say, sound more excited. Oh, sorry, I'm pretty excited about. It. I think it's going to be great. I've I've done your shows at festivals a few times before, and it's always been a lot of fun. Oh, thank you very much. Sure. Um, oh. Before we go, I should also say here at Stupid Old Studios where we record this, we've had a lot of a lot of our friends um, rehearse their shows here, and I saw a run through of this show, No Show, uh, mm. last week. And it's going to be fucking hilarious. So you should go see that. That's with uh, Ben Russell and Xavier Michael Edes. I think it's 11, 15. around 11.15. 11, 15. Also at the Imperial Hotel. You can Imperial. make a night of it. Do a facty fact. And I think it's probably in the same room straight up. Sweet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, okay. So thanks so much. That is a hot tip from us. Comedyfestival.com.au is where you book those. And uh, if you're not in Melbourne, I'm sure we'll see you sometime later in the year. I'm going to Sydney in May. But we'll keep you posted on that. Thank you so much. That is us for now. And uh, we'll be back with a report next week. Uh, bye. Waiters. Bye. <laughs> Guys, just when you thought the plugs were over, Dave here to saying that since recording this, we've actually picked a date when we're going to do the quiz show with Jess and Matt as the guests. It is actually next Wednesday, March the 30th at 10.15 at the Imperial Hotel. If you uh, book tickets through comedyfestival.com.au, it takes you to try booking... And if you type in the uh, code do go on, all tickets are just 10 bucks. We really want to come and meet you guys. So if you can make it down Wednesday, March 30, Facty Fact versus the audience, special guests Jess Perkins and Matt Stewart. All right, love y'all. 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 All right, love y'all.